Well, good morning, Gospel Hope. Morning. It is a joy to be here with you once again. This is our second to last service for my wife and I to be here with you as we prepare to move to the Dominican Republic and plant Ciudad de Gracia, Iglesia Ciudad de Gracia, Great City Church. By God's grace, we are in the final leg of support racing and getting our things ready to move to Santo Domingo. And I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for uh, the way you have supported us through your prayers, through the relationships that we've been able to develop here in our uh, year that we've been uh, living here in Atlanta, moving from Chicago, and now as we move to Santo Domingo. Thank you so much. We are so excited to see what the Lord is going to do and how we can partner together in advancing the gospel in Santo Domingo and uh, in the island. And we have a vision to see Latin America also be reached with the gospel. So thank you on behalf of my wife, our kids. Uh, we are so thankful that you are our sending church. So we feel well uh, cared and loved by you. So thank you. Uh, gracias. So this morning, I am going to be kicking off a series, a new series called um, Anthropology, a series on doctrine. Doctrine and the title of our uh, the subject that we're going to be looking at this morning is doctrine, the doctrine of anthropology, which simply means the study of humanity, the study of humanity. Typically, we take a text of the scripture from the scripture and we study it and we ex expound on the text. But this morning, I'm going to kick us off in a study of uh, doctrine in general, and I'm going to be focusing on the image of God, doctrine, the image of God in men. I'm going to be answering two questions. What does it mean to be created in the image of God? And second, what are the implications of being created in the image of God for your life and for my life? So before we begin, let's bring this time before the Lord and ask him to uh, guide us through this time. Father, thank you for the work of Jesus on our behalf to uh, give us new hope and new life. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of uh, being able to open your word this morning, and we pray that through the power and enabling of your spirit that you help me speak, communicate clearly, and also may your church receive your word with uh, meekness. Uh, give us as a church a desire to be not only doers, uh, hearers of your word, but also doers of your word. Uh, and may this word have an application to our hearts even uh, today as we walk out. In your name we pray. Amen. We are in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, there's a lot of movies being filmed here. Uh, and it has become one of the most popular hotspots here right now in the United States to become and pursue a career or pursue uh, a career in the movie industry. So as I was reading through the text, I could not walk away from this uh, picture, this movie in my mind as I was reading through Genesis 1. And I was just picturing God creating the world in Genesis chapter 1 and act number 1, act number 2, act number 3. And that's why in my mind, the way I think is I'm going to divide these three main points in three main acts of creation. And the first act that we find this morning is the act of God creating man in his image. Man is man created in the image of God. Look with me in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and all over the earth. And over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. What we find here, most theologians call it a divine or a triune dialogue between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And one of the most profound truths that we find here in the account of God's creation is that, is that in these chapters, we read of the divine, majestic power of God creating the world out of nothing. 
just by the breath and power of his word. Think about this, the incredible scene that it would have been to be, to see a formless, empty, and dark earth being transformed by his word. And now there is light. Now there is day and night. The waters found their proper place in this earth. Dry land now welcomes a beautiful vegetation. Trees, all kinds of animals are created. This is an amazing scene here in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. It almost feels like there is nothing else that God could have done, humanly speaking, to top this glorious and divine work whom the author repeatedly says it was good. God's creation was good. And then we read a divine conversation between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And then they said, by the way, let's stop it up. Let's make and create man in our likeness, in our image. The, the traditional uh, interpretation for this is that typically this is a divine triune conversation between the God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It feels as if God wants to crown his creation, his handiwork, with the work and creation of men and women to create human life. That is a prominent narrative that we find throughout the scripture where God gives significance and value to his creation. And he creates Adam or Adam, which means humanity or men. Kind. And then he creates Eve. And then as he creates Adam and Eve, they had the purpose to be an image bearer, to be a displayer of the image of God. Then he says, let's create them in our image, in our image after our likeness. Two words here for the word image is the word selim and the word the mood. And they both denote and they have the same connotation. It's a double emphasis. I want him to make and look and represent who we are. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in perfect communion, joy, and fellowship. They're saying we want others to experience what we experience. We want others to participate in the perfection and unity and communion that we get to participate so we're going to create them so that they can experience such a thing and in, in, in doing so, finding joy and fulfillment. In other words, to describe this idea of made in the image of God is, is simply put this way. I heard an author say, to be made in the image of God means to reflect and represent who God is. Is to reflect and represent who God is. Is. There is a wonderful representation or replica of Noah's Ark in Kentucky. How many of you have been to the Ark Museum? It's amazing. Those who build this replica of the Ark opened the Bible and they literally took the same measurements that God gave Noah in Genesis chapter 6. And they came up with this massive boat as described in the Bible, in the scriptures. Now, this is not the original boat. But it gives us an idea, a picture, it reflects what it might have looked like, but also it represents the message and the work that God had intended to do in Genesis chapter 6. So this ark is not the original ark, but it represents and reflects what God intended to do in Genesis chapter 6. In the same way, church, you and I are not to be, you're not, are not the original. We are not the original gods. We are meant to reflect and represent God in and through our lives. Even though we might feel that we own our own destiny and that we know what we want to do and that we are in charge in this world, the reality is that you and I were made for His glory. You and I were meant to reflect his glory. So in every conversation, in any interaction that you might have with people, you need to remember and you need to understand that you and I are reflectors. We are meant to represent our God in everything we do. We're just reflecting God's glory into the world. Now, how are we like God? This is a difficult question. 
and I am not smart enough to answer that, so I relied on Wayne Grudem on this one, on his book on systematic theology. There are some aspects in which we can reflect the likeness of God. There are many more of them, and many uh, theologians have different perspectives on this, but I think this is a very solid foundation to begin with. How are human beings, if we are meant to reflect God and who He is and represent Him here in this world, how are we like God? Well, first of all, Grudem points out that we are moral beings. We are able to make uh, decisions, moral decisions between good and bad, right and wrong. So that moral, that moral aspect that we uh, are able to express today in humanity is that it's an expression of who God is. Second, we're not only moral beings, but we're also spiritual beings. We all know that we are not only physical bodies, but also immaterial spirits, Grudem says. And we can therefore act in ways that are significant in the immaterial and spiritual realm of existence. So our relationship with God, it, there's uh, this inner connection because of the spiritual beings that we are and God being also a spirit. Also, we are relational or he calls them mental beings. In other words, we are able to process ideas and process concepts. And, and then he points out here something very interesting. The, the creative activity of humans with art, music, literature, science, and all these aspects of life, they reveal how we can mentally and rationally work through things with our brains, with our minds. And fourthly, how are we like God? How do we share that likeness with God? Fourthly, he points out here, we are relational beings. We are relational beings. That means that we need other people around us. And in the same context that the beauty of the Trinity in Genesis chapter 1 are interacting in perfect relationship and communion, we, you and I, are meant to live in relationships. And we, you and I, we thrive and when we are within the context of relationships, isn't that true when we hit the pandemic a year and a half ago and how we were confined and we lived in isolation? Many of us were pulling our hairs off and we're saying, I need people. I don't want another Zoom meeting. I don't, know, I don't want another hangout meeting. I just want to be a church. I just want to see somebody. I just want to travel and see some people. Why? Because we all long for relationships. God is a relational being the, tri the trinity in relationship with one another. So we are relational beings as well. So all that mouthful there, resume this way. We are meant to reflect and represent the glory of God in this world. That's what you're made for. Now, if that is true, what are some implications that come about from this reality that we are created in the image of God. There are two implications. There are more implications to this. I just picked two. I encourage you in your community groups as you discuss this week to add more to them. But here are two implications of being created and being made in the image of God. Number one, all human beings have value and significance. All human beings have value and significance. This truth ought to change the way we view others in this world. Regardless of the, what background we come from, our culture, how we were raised, where, whether we're rich or poor, whether they ha we have a different color of our skin, whether we have capacities or we don't have certain capacities, depending on the stage of our lives, all human beings are created in the image of God. Therefore, they have value and significance. Those who are vulnerable, marginalized, the poor, the rich, the young, the old, the healthy, and, and the ill, the one who is in the womb and is about to come out of the womb, the one who, who, who created them, he says to you and to me, they are valuable to me, therefore they have significance. And if that is true, the second implication is this, we must treat one another as valuable human beings. We must treat then. If we believe it, we're saying amen to I am created in the image of God. And the image of God is in everybody. And I'm supposed to reflect the image of God in everything I do. And in doing so, reflect His glory. Then the way we treat one another ought to be different than what we are oftentimes 
tempted to not live out. We must treat one another as valuable human beings. The reality is this. As I was driving away on Friday after VBS, after a long evening, we stopped at McDonald's not far from here on the way home. And we stopped uh, in front of Julie McCammack. She's in front of us there. The line is super slow. We were there for a good 30, 35 minutes, if maybe more. It felt that, that long. Finally, we get our food. We double check our bags, and, and we're missing our chicken nuggets for the kids. So I get upset. I pull on the side, and I'm like, oh, we waited for that long. I need to go to get the chicken nuggets. I go in, and I'm checking uh, I'm talking to the lady, and as I come back with the chicken nuggets, my wife is talking to an individual who is on the side of, the, of our minivan, and he's talking to her. He, he's, 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 uh, he's not well-dressed. He's, he's just His hair is all over the place. He has a long beard, and he, he sounds like he was drinking. His eyes are red. He's just, he just doesn't look well and he's begging for food so my wife and I look at each other and we say what do we do I said I'm not going to give you money but I'll give you food let's go into McDonald's and buy some food so I'm starting to walk to McDonald's and he says oh no no I, I want to go eat at this place so he 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 takes me to this place so I, I go to the place he wants to eat and I'm inside and I'm trying to get his story and to be honest in my heart I'm starting to get a little bit like agitated like first of all Man, if somebody offers you food, you, you, you go whatever they, t- they, they pay for you. Second, uh, you've been drinking. Where do you, where, where, where's the money? You don't have money because you may, I'm saying all of this in my mind and in, in my head. I'm increasingly getting agitated. And then all of a sudden, I'm trying to get his story. What is your story? Where are we from? Well, I'm, I'm homeless. I'm from this country. Uh, and I have a family, and we don't have anything to eat, and today is my son's birthday. That's why we're doing this. And, and the story just doesn't make sense. And I began to say, okay, he's probably, he's probably ripping me off. I wonder how many people he tricked like this. But here we go. I'm going to buy this food and just walk out of here. And all of a sudden, because he did not look like me or he did not look like a person that I would initially give myself and my heart to initially. All of a sudden, the Spirit of God told me, Manuel, he's made in my image. Therefore, he has value and significance. Yes, he sounds like he's been drinking. Yes, his hair is all over the place. Yes, his story might be a lie and we don't know what's going on in that life right now. But one thing is true. He's made in my image, therefore you treat him as such. Oh, church, how are we treating one another? That has massive implication in our relationships at home, in our marriage, in our kids. When we finally blow it for the 20th times and we yell from the top of our lungs what are we communicating to our kids we're saying I am superior to you and we are forgetting that these little ones are created in the image of God or oh, those who disagree in our with our political preferences how are we treating one another just because he doesn't believe what I believe or he doesn't stand where I stand, it doesn't mean that I'm going to mistreat our brothers and sisters just because they are different than me. You and I, made in the image of God, if we believe that, we got to treat one another as valuable human beings. What a challenge for us, for you, and for me. Act number one, we saw man created in the image of God. Act number two, we find men distorting the image of God. God created this image perfectly. There's no sin in chapters 1 and 2. We get to chapter 3 of Genesis, and the perfect reflection that Adam and Eve were constantly given to creation of who God is, is broken. All of a sudden, there's a stop. There's a distortion of this image in Genesis chapter 
3. If you go with me in Genesis chapter 3, you find verse 4. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. She comes, the serpent comes and says, hey, by the way, you, you can eat of any tree. Did God really say that? And, and there are, there's this argument and back and forth between Adam and Eve. And then Satan gives him the big lie. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And we need to pay attention to this because what Satan is saying, they're saying three things here in these verses right here. He's saying God, he's challenging God's wisdom in creation. He's implying that Adam and Eve aren't really special to God because he's blinded you from something greater outside of this creation. Satan is implying that God is hiding things from you and from me, from Adam and Eve. Your eyes will be open, Satan says. In other words, you deserve better. And it isn't, isn't that the, the foundation? And isn't that where everything starts when we do not treat one another as valuable human beings? It begins with selfish ambitions where we be, begin to believe that we deserve better. I deserve better than this. I deserve better this, than, this, than this situation. I deserve the better. Second, Satan is, all, is also challenging the supreme authority of God by promising God-like authority to them. When he says, you will be like God, in the original, it literally means you will be like Elohim. The, the, the precious name of God. He isn't saying you will be like an angel. You will be like somebody else. No, no, no. He's saying you will be like a God. You would be like Elohim directly. You are going to substitute Elohim from his rightful place. And you will be in charge. Satan's also implying here. Challenging through his, through his uh, words, he's challenging God's definition of good and evil. Look what he says, knowing good and evil. But the, the truth is that they knew what good and evil was because God had already given them the rules and the expectations of what to do and what not to do. So they eat of the fruit. And unfortunately, from that time on, humanity, you and I, have been following and pursuing the restoring of this image of God, the fulfillment and the meaning and significance for our lives. We've been pursuing it from Genesis chapter 3. The perfect image of God now is lost. Now Adam and Eve were committed to stop pursuing and projecting the image of God. And they said, I want to create and project my own image. I want to be the one in charge. I want to call the shots. I want to create the plan. I want to be, to be uh, served. I don't want to be the one serving. I want to be the one receiving this service. And from that time on, all of us have been searching for meaning and significance in this world. We have tried to recreate what a fulfilled, happy human being looks like. And what the world has to do and what the world has to say to us to be successful. So today the world tells us a happy, fulfilled person is the one who has many, plenty resources, money. Someone who, has, who, who gives to the poor. Someone who has great relationships. Someone who, who gives to society. Someone who is well known and important in society and in this world. Someone, the world tells us that we pursue the American dream. And then you will find significance and meaning in your life. Uh, other things that the world tells us is that you have, if you have the right body, if you have the right diet, if you have the right, the right looks, then you will have meaning and significance. So we've given ourselves into billions of dollars trying to change our bodies and our minds, trying to find change and significance from within. And all, in all of this, God is saying, because of the human brokenness, you will never be able to find meaning and significance outside of me. When I don't live to reflect and, re and represent God in my life, I will be prone to frustration and dissatisfaction. Has, it, has that happened to you? Every time you walk away from making your life's goal 
to glorify God in everything you do, you're always going to be frustrated and dissatisfied. You're always longing and looking for more. True joy and significance is found when reflecting the glory of God becomes my priority. But what happened? In the fall in Genesis chapter 3, the image of God now is blurred, is distorted, and you find throughout history humans trying to regain that image of God in their own strength. Act number three, what do we need then? How do we restore this image of God? Jesus restores the image of God. Jesus comes then and he restores the image of God that was lost in the garden. God knows and sees the incredible confusion and destruction that sin causes in our lives from the beginning of humanity. And he had devised this perfect and beautiful plan. So Jesus sent, God sent his son Jesus to the world to, to show us a picture of what really meaning and significance looks like and where it can be found. In John 14, 9, Jesus says to Philip, whoever has seen, has seen me has seen the Father. Who how can you say, show us the Father? In other words, Jesus comes into the picture. The disciples are a little bit disturbed by the fact that Jesus is going to die on the cross. And Jesus says, by the way, Philip, if you've seen me, you're seeing the perfect image of God. The, the, the sum and the total sum of what you've been longing for all your life is found in my person. It's found in my life. And I'm going to lay down my life so that my image can be implanted in your hearts. And now you can have meaning and satisfaction for all eternity. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then in Colossians chapter, chapter uh, 1 verse 15, God, Paul says, He is talking about Jesus, the invis invisible image of God. Show us how we restore this image. Show us how we restore and regain significance and meaning in this world. Paul says, look at Jesus. He is the image of God. What you've been longing for, what you've been looking for, is found in the person of Jesus. Why is this so significant? Because on the cross, Jesus cried for died for you and for me so that you and I can have access so that you and I can have our eyes and the veils of our heart removed lifted and see the glory the beauty the satisfaction that can only be found in Jesus yes. Jesus restores the image of God lost in Genesis chapter 3 do you want to reflect and represent God in your marriage Look at the image of God in Jesus. Do you want to represent God uh, faithfully at your work? Look at Jesus. Do you want to parent in a way that reflects glass glory? Look at Jesus. Do you want to be free from being, uh, from being a people pleaser and become a God pleaser? Look at Jesus. On the cross, he gives us access to a perfect sight. And this sight is glorious the way Paul explains it in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15. Paul is saying, when before you came to Christ, there was a veil that blocked and did not let you see, understand the law of Moses. But then when, when Christ came and, 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 and lifted that veil and removed it from you, now you can see. But what is it that we can see? He says, verse 18, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord. Beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Do you want to reflect the image of God? Gaze on Jesus. 
open up God's Word and cling to the Gospel, cling to the truths of God's Word that point you to the beauty, the glory, the power and majesty of Jesus. And nothing but Jesus can give you the right perspective in life, can give you the right significance in this world. So as we look at Jesus, we, he says we are being transformed from glory to glory. Glory to glory. Oh, church, imagine, I imagine my daughter, Noemi, sometimes she comes to me and she says, Daddy, how do I look when you're coming to church? And I say, girl, you look great. What she's trying to do is she's trying to find approval from me. Before she walks out the door. What she's, what she's trying to say, I'm a little bit insecure. I, I, I don't know what the world is going to think. I don't know what people are going to think when I step in the car and I go to church or go somewhere. Else. I just need some confidence, some approval. D Daddy, how do I look? And I sometimes would say something like, oh, Noemi, you look beautiful. It doesn't matter what you wear. You're so beautiful regardless of what you're wearing right now. And she kind of walks away confident with this confidence and gets going. You and I do that all the time and we need that assurance from our God. But the problem is sometimes we, we ask that question to the wrong crowd, the wrong person. We ask it to the world. Hey, hey world, how, how do I look? Well, you... You need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this, you need to do that. And then you will find significance and meaning in life. And on the other side, we should be asking the question, Jesus, I'm weak, I'm feeble, I'm wretched. How do I look? And Jesus says, I, I see my blood on you. So you're welcomed. You're received. Come home, son. Amen. Come with me. It doesn't depend on the outward appearance and how I look, but in, in the eternal security that I am loved and secure in my Father's arms. And that's the image of God restored in and through the work of Jesus Christ. Amen. Church, what image are you embracing today? If you are a believer in Jesus Christ this morning, I challenge you and I encourage you to evaluate your heart and think hard through this. What am I pursuing? What image am I trying to portray to the world? It's a time to call to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me because I have not been reflecting your glory and your image the way I should. But it's a time to rejoice and celebrate because in Jesus this image has been restored and because he lives in you now you can be free to live your life in a way that pleases him let's pray father we are interested in what you think of us above all things and thank you for reminding us this morning that we are called to reflect and represent the image of God into the world. And Father, we can only do that through the power and work of your Son, Jesus Christ, helping us see and taking the veil off so that we can experience your glory. Father, we confess as church, as a church, that it is so hard at times to live this way, to live with this mindset and perspective, the glory of God. So we confess right now. We take a time to, to cry out to you and say, Lord, forgive me for living for myself, for making me the center of my own life. Lord, forgive me for... Forgive us 
for making life about us at times. But Lord, we joyfully rejoice and embrace the forgiveness and newness of life that we find in the gospel. Yes, we failed, but yes, you're great. Yes, we've sinned, but your blood forgives all of our sins. So we want to humbly submit to you and joyfully embrace the beauty of the gospel. Make us a church that is so concerned with reflecting the glory and image of Jesus that this world, that DeKalb County, that Atlanta, that the world is transformed by. And at the end, please, would you receive the glory, not us. It is in your name that we pray. Amen.